Today, I'm talking about some of the newer oral anticoagulants, the Bigatran marketed as Pradaxa and Rivaroxaban marketed as Xeralto. I'm focusing on these two drugs in particular because they serve as a wonderful illustration of some of the complexities of drug research and marketing that are largely hidden from public view and how doctors can still be fooled into making treatment mistakes even when prescribing according to the principles of evidence-based medicine. We hear a lot about these drugs in conferences and in the hospital, and it's easy to accept at face value how wonderful they are, but they have a lot of problems. For those of you who haven't already watched my video on anticoagulation, you may find it helpful to view first. To briefly review, anticoagulants, which are just part of a broad group of drugs that lay people know as blood thinners, have been around for a long time. These drugs are used primarily to lower stroke risk and atrial fibrillation, to treat and prevent DVTs and pulmonary embolisms, and to prevent thrombosis of mechanical heart valves. Up until the last several years, warfarin was the only available oral anticoagulant. Although warfarin has a huge amount of data supporting its use for these conditions, and physicians and pharmacists have an equally huge amount of experience using it, it nevertheless has many problems. The major visible problem is that its anticoagulant effect is dependent upon many factors, including dietary intake of vitamin K, drug-drug interactions, genetics, age, and concurrent medical conditions. Thus, there is much variability in the optimal dose between different patients, and even within the same patient at different points in time. So as a consequence, patients can easily bounce around between not being anticoagulated enough with subsequent increased risk of thrombosis, or being too anticoagulated with subsequent increased risk of bleeding. To combat this problem, patients need to get their blood checked routinely in order to measure something called the International Normalized Ratio, or INR. If the INR is too high, the warfarin dose is adjusted downwards. If it's too low, the dose is adjusted upwards. The appropriate frequency of INR checks might be once a month in a patient who is relatively healthy and has been on a stable dose for a while, and it might be a couple times a week in a patient who is just starting on warfarin or who is very ill or just prescribed some antibiotics. With a significant inconvenience of frequent lab checks and the inconvenience of being particularly conscientious of one's diet, it's easy to appreciate why so many patients hate warfarin. And you know what? Doctors and pharmacists hate warfarin just as much. It's a huge pain and time sink to manage it. So much so that some healthcare systems have entire clinics dedicated to nothing more than warfarin management. Talk about a boring job. So for decades, just about everyone has been anxiously awaiting the development of new oral anticoagulants which don't require routine monitoring. And finally, just a few years ago, some of these new drugs started getting enough clinical trial data to support government approval here in the US. We have the Bigatran, which acts as a direct inhibitor of a proclotting factor called thrombin. And we now have three direct factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. This was huge news for many people. Patients were excited because it meant less blood draws. Doctors were excited because it meant less hassle of micromanaging drug doses. And drug companies were excited because it meant bigger profits because they can charge way more for these drugs than they could for warfarin. Probably the only people who didn't welcome these drugs are those who manufactured the equipment used to test the INR. For a few years, all seemed well. Unfortunately, the honeymoon period for the new oral anticoagulants may be over because some significant concerns have been recently raised about the Bigatran and Rivaroxaban, the first two of these drugs to be FDA approved. The Bigatran was FDA approved in 2010, largely on the basis of the RELY trial, which showed non-inferiority to warfarin for the prevention of stroke in non-valvular AFib. Here's the data from that trial. You can see that the risk of stroke or systemic embolization for 110 mg dose of the Bigatran was similar to that of warfarin, and the risk with the 150 mg dose of the Bigatran was lower than both the 110 mg dose and that of warfarin. When safety outcomes were looked at, the 110 mg dose was associated with less bleeding than warfarin, while the 150 mg dose was associated with the same amount. So the very superficial takeaway from this trial is that low-dose dobigatran was as effective as warfarin at preventing strokes, but had less bleeding, and that high-dose dobigatran was more effective than warfarin at preventing strokes, 
with the same risk of bleeding. That probably sounds wonderful. Two doses of a new drug, each of which offers a benefit over the only previously available option. But there's more to the data than this, and the FDA did not respond in a logical, patient-centered way. Specifically, they only approved the higher dose. While there may have been immediate, relative, mild skepticism of the RELY trial and the FDA's subsequent actions, most people, including myself, were unaware of any issues until the British Medical Journal published a series of reports and analyses in the summer of 2014, which were critical of the drug, the study, the investigators, and the FDA. The papers themselves are definitely worth a read, but in summary, they collectively make the following claims. The manufacturer of dabigatran was aware of substantial variability in the plasma levels of the drug when patients took fixed doses without monitoring or titration. This is important because variability in plasma levels directly correlate with bleeding risk, and there are pharmacological reasons to suspect that the bigotran in particular would be prone to such variability, much the same way warfarin is. The articles also claimed that an internal analysis from the manufacturer concluded optimally used, that is titrated, the bigotran has the potential to provide patients an even better efficacy and safety profile than fixed dose to bigotran and also a better safety and efficacy profile than matched warfarin group. This analysis was intentionally withheld from the public because it would undercut the primary benefit of dabigatran over warfarin, that is, that routine monitoring was not necessary. Let that sink in for just a moment. A drug company had the opportunity to make their drug safer, but chose not to do so because it would make their drug less appealing and would therefore cut into their profits. So I don't know how much the FDA knew about this issue when they approved the drug. Maybe they were completely oblivious to it. However, even with the data that we know for a fact was made available to the FDA, they still only approved the higher of the two doses. This despite the fact that the manufacturer had wanted to market the lower dose for safer use in the elderly and in renal impairment. The reason for the FDA's rejection was that patients and doctors alike would be prone to overutilization of the lower dose in order to prevent bleeding, placing the patients at higher than necessary risk of harm. However, all that does is take away choice from patients and their doctors. It would be like saying, we will only allow a 40 milligram dose of lisinopril to be prescribed for hypertension because that was the dose shown in a study to have the greatest long-term benefits irrespective of whether a doctor feels that a patient's specific situation makes a lower dose more appropriate. It's illogical and not patient-centered. And if you think the issue with dabigatran sounds crazy, wait until you hear about the issues with rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban was FDA-approved for non-valvular AFib in 2011, primarily based upon the results of the ROCKET AF trial. This was a double-blind RCT of 14,000 patients with non-valvular AFib comparing effectiveness and safety of rivaroxaban to warfarin. Similar to RELY, the primary endpoints were stroke or systemic embolization, and secondary endpoints were major and non-major clinically relevant bleeding. As with RELY and dabigatran, rivaroxaban demonstrated that it was non-inferior to warfarin at preventing strokes. Overall bleeding risk was identical between groups, but rivaroxaban was associated with less intracranial hemorrhage and less fatal bleeding. That sounds great, right? Just as effective, but with less life-threatening side effects and no need for routine monitoring. Well, once again, a BMJ investigation has uncovered a serious problem. The point-of-care meters that were used to measure INR and guide therapy in the warfarin arm of the study were defective so defective that they were recalled after the study was published. The devices systematically underestimated INR such that patients would have had their warfarin increased to higher than appropriate or intended doses, thus increasing the bleeding risk. So the decreased risk from fatal bleeding that appeared to favor rivaroxaban may be totally erroneous in the opposite direction from reality. That is, it is completely possible that warfarin is associated with lower bleeding risk or it's possible that warfarin is less effective at preventing strokes, or both, or neither. The point is, without accurate measurement of INR during the trial, we have no idea 
the entire trial looks to be useless. And since this was the basis of rivaroxaban's approval, it calls into question whether rivaroxaban's approval should be rescinded until a new study is performed. Even more damning than that, subsequent litigation has uncovered internal emails from the manufacturer in which researchers were questioning the accuracy of the tests while the trial was still underway, but that these concerns were not discussed in the Rocket AF paper and were never passed on to the FDA during the drug's approval process. Furthermore, according to subsequent news stories, even after the devices were recalled and the public became aware of potential problems with Rocket AF, researchers intentionally hid potentially conflicting data in order to deceive editors at the New England Journal of Medicine when a follow-up paper was published in which they claimed the faulty device should not alter the original interpretation or significance. And it seems highly unlikely the FDA will actually rescind Rivaroxaban's approval, since in beautiful irony, the newly confirmed head of the FDA, Robert Califf, was a senior investigator on the Rocket AF study. The newer 10A inhibitors, Apixaban and Edoxaban, haven't been associated with any comparable controversies yet, but they are also newer and their data has not been vetted as much. The problems with dibigatran and rivaroxaban weren't discovered for a few years after the respective key trials and subsequent FDA approval. Hopefully, at least one of these drugs will pan out as a successful, effective, and safe alternative to warfarin. To be clear, I don't think that the problems with the Bigotran and Rivaroxaban represent some nefarious national conspiracy perpetrated by the pharmaceutical FDA New England Journal complex. But I do think the public and healthcare professionals alike have been misled, and it's hard to escape the conclusion that key information has been intentionally downplayed in order to protect profits. I've talked about these issues with my colleagues, some of whom know more than I do about the studies in question, and they still prescribe these drugs, albeit cautiously, inappropriately selected patients. Prescribing Pradaxa and Zeralto for FDA-approved indications is not malpractice. But I'm personally still not sold on them, at least not yet. If I needed to be on an anticoagulant, I would choose warfarin, no question. There certainly have been additional trials of these drugs since Rely and Rocket AF, and I'm sure there will continue to be more trials. However, once a large randomized controlled trial like Rely or Rocket AF has been published in such a journal as the New England Journal of Medicine, and the drug has been FDA approved, the cat's sort of out of the bag. It actually takes a much greater burden of evidence against a drug to get its approval pulled than it does to prevent its approval in the first place. Plus, given the enormous multi-billion dollar market for these drugs, it doesn't take much imagination to believe that there are even more unrevealed problems with Rely and Rocket AF, as well as with all the other studies, almost all of which have been funded by the drug companies themselves. The more general takeaway here is that as a healthcare professional, Practicing so-called evidence-based medicine sounds wonderful until you realize that some of the evidence is far from perfect, while other evidence has been intentionally hidden from your view.